not going to read everything that's on the screen. I think you can read the captions here. Uh, th this, uh, I'm going to introduce my counter, my alter ego, the Godfather here, uh, and he will be kind of uh, watching over us through the talk today. I want you to know that you're all entrepreneurs. Everybody in this room is an entrepreneur, whether you know it or not. And this is what we're about to talk about. Uh, nothing you learned in medical school prepares you to going into this hair transplant business. This is a business that requires marketing skills and people management skills. You never learned that in medical school. It requires technical skills. They're not learned in residencies or any place like that. This is a market-driven business that is highly competitive. We don't know anything about competition when we enter this business. It requires to train and acquire uh, staff of technicians and nurses because without them you can't do a quality surgery and we all have come to realize that but that's a, a skill again that you don't learn in medical school. So from a classical point of view you're all entrepreneurs. You, all, you have brains on your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can stare yourself any direction you choose so don't worry and relax and enjoy what I'm about to tell you. And I want to thank everybody for coming and all of the important people like uh, Tommy and Parsa and Victoria and, and you, the audience, who's the most, uh, I, I think I know almost everybody in this audience is a pleasure after all these years. The entrepreneur's view of the world is nothing is done. Everything in the world remains to be done or done over. The greatest picture is not yet painted. The greatest play is not yet written. The greatest poem is unsung opportunity awaits. There are 10 characteristics of a successful entrepreneur and I want you to identify these with these as I read them for you. The ability to filter ideas and keep the good ones and throw away the bad ones. This is probably the single most important part of the entrepreneur. So uh, we have decision points throughout our career. You have to be visionary and intuitive. You have to see beyond the obvious. You're willing to break rules, face failures, accept criticism, bounce back, buck, cult buck culture, be open to change. You have to be tenacious and persistent. You have to search for new ideas, willing to take risks. Na naivete, as you're going to learn, is, is one of my uh, defects. Uh, it, you have to be driven to succeed, motivated by challenge, be creative and innovative. You want to build things. You're never satisfied with the status quo. My motto in this world is there's always a better way. Most, most people have the ability to build and manage teams of people. Uh, and and you, can, you can look in, in yourself and see those abilities. And you should recognize the role of serendipity in lives. So I want to tell you a very quick story about Charles Goodyear. He was playing with rubber. And he was trying to figure out how to make rubber good for wheels and, and much more resilient. And he was playing with adding sulfur in his, in his kitchen when the rubber fell on the hot stove. Voila, vulcanized rubber. He patented it, and in, in 1853, he became the leader and the controller of the world's rubber market. <laughs> because it was serendipity, it wasn't any genius that did it, it just accidentally happened. And he recognized the invention when it was there. And that's something we all have to keep in mind as we go forward. So let's talk about the entrepreneur. I'm certainly fitting the character of what the Godfather says here. You have to be a bit crazy. You have to really, uh, and maybe today, after I talk today, you'll, you'll uh, prove myself wrong, I don't know. The, the word quit is not in my vocabulary, so, uh, Humankind is programmed to chase progress, says uh, Jürgen Schmidger. I can't pronounce his last name, sorry. But it's important to know that, that our genes are programmed to do this. Uh, I've been involved with more than two dozen businesses in my career. I have more than four dozen patents, uh, US and world patents. And I'll show you a few of them today. I'm not going to give you an exhaustive view of my career. Anyone who has never made a mistake has never really tried anything new, said Albert Einstein. Very important concept. So let's take a look at the uh, first venture that I did 
It was when I was in medical school, I was developing pumps in, a, in, a, in my medical school, and then I went into my internship and my fellowship, and I was lucky enough to land a fellowship with Dr. Seawalt Lillehei, the man who invented heart surgery, and uh, under his uh, money, his big pocketbook, I developed the intraortic balloon pump, and uh, that, uh, as you know, everybody's, I'm sure, seen this in their career. It's in every coronary care unit in the world. I'm not the inventor of that. I'm just the person who brought it out commercially. Um, it probably saves thousands of lives every year, and it's probably one of my great contributions in, in, in medicine. In 1969, Dr. Lillehei said, with time to introduce this to the world, and there was a meeting of 850 cardiologists and he was uh, obviously the keynote speaker, and he wanted to talk about the intraortic balloon pump on the panel. For those of you who don't know, Michael DeBakey and Denton Cooley were the two famous heart surgeons in, in Texas. Dr. Kalf invented the artificial kidney, and Dr. Hastings was the NIH, National Heart Institute director, and they were on the panel. And then the day before, he comes to me and he says, Bill, I can't be there. You have to give the keynote speak, speaker. And, and, and I said, my God, I have to talk? And he says, let me tell you, you can't use any slides, you can't use any movies, you just have to do it on your charisma alone. So here I am with the four most famous people in the field, and nobody ever heard of Dr. Rassman. Uh, I'm a nobody on the panel now, and with these other famous doctors, and I had to figure out how to basically get heard. So what did I do? I, I found the most beautiful woman I was dating, I wired her chest with the entry order balloon leads. I walked her down the aisle to the front of the stage, plugged her in. <laughs> she held the balloon in her hand. It was beating at 180 beats per minute. I thought she was fibrillating. <laughs> and and uh, I said, ladies and gentlemen, this is the entry order balloon pump. I can tell you I was the hit of the show. <laughs> okay, the nobody actually made a dent because a beautiful woman spoke for me. So uh, I think everybody knows uh, the outcome of this. I was, I was involved, fortunately, with him in developing all types of pumps and valves. Uh, some of the St. Jude valves that are out today were developed in my laboratory uh, as well under my uh, leadership. So I had a lot of role in the, in the cardiac field. So there were two benefits that came out of that. First, I made my first mini fortune by acquiring stock in the company for the intraortic balloon pump. And then I married the girl <laughs> that, that walked up on the stage. That was two months later. I had one other thing that happened to me, is the Army gave me my draft notice, and I was sent to Vietnam. So that was the bad side about the whole thing. So creativity is thinking up new things. Innovation is doing new things. And that's important to keep in mind when you try to distinguish the, the two different words. So let's take a look at the rest of my career uh, in, in a scanning view. I, I went into general surgery practice and I was fairly diverse. I was trained in a lot of fields and I did all of these things. And then I got bored and I, I find that boredom is something that sets in me all the time and I look for new things to do. So I uh, decided to buy a dairy farm expanded the dairy farm to be the biggest dairy farm in the county. Now, I, I was trying to figure out how to tell you about the dairy farm, and then I uh, realized I didn't want to tell you about me coming back at midnight on the way up by country road to my farmhouse and finding my entire herd running towards town, down the road, and I had to veer with my car not to hit my own herd and how to get them back. And I got the cows back in the barn, and the next night, the same thing happened again. And then I realized some cow figured out a way to break out of the barn. So I slept in the barn trying to identify the cow <laughs> and the way the cow got out. I also agreed to, to, to not tell you about the intensive care unit I set up when 40 of my cows got pneumonia. And I went to the hospital and got IV bags. I called the drug reps and I said, I need lots of antibiotics. They shipped it by the case because I was the busiest surgeon in the state, so it wasn't a problem getting what I wanted. I would take specimens from the cow's udder and the cow's blood and the cow's nostrils, and I would run it in the hospital laboratory to get cultures, and I would do cultures and sensitivities on those cows. Did you ever, can you imagine 
a half a ton cow, 40 of them with intravenouses twice a day. I was running that, it was hell. It was one week of hell. And I will not tell you about my herdsman who saw my best cow, who was about 1,200 pounds, heading out to the manure pit. And he hopped to try to catch her, grabs the chain around her neck, and the cow and he goes into the manure pit 15 feet deep, full of man liquid manure. And he grabs onto a drain pipe with one hand, and he grabs onto her chin with the other hand, and starts screaming for help as I come out on the way to go to surgery and stopped in the barn, which was my, new t my normal routine, dressed in a suit, fancy shoes, tie, and, and here I was hearing the scream for help. And of course, the manure was up to my knees as I ran through the barn and found the, the, the herdsman there. He was about 300 pounds. Uh, he was about five foot two tall, so he was very small, a small man, very roly-poly. And I said, drop the cow and let me pull you out. He says, no, I'm not coming out. He says, the cow comes out first, I come out second. I can't tell you, I had to cancel my surgery that day, and it took me all day to get the damn cow out of that manure pit, and finally he came out afterward. So what I decided to tell you, the, by the way, that's Bessie, just to tell you, that that was the cow that fell in the manure pit. She was the best milker I had. She never milked after that. She was making 22 gallons a day at the time. And naive was unbelievable. Uh, naive really defined me because I didn't know what end the milk came out when I bought the, the, the dairy farm. So I got into raising my own crops. I grew alfalfa, I grew corn. Uh, alfalfa, as you can see from over here, has a, a root structure and bacteria produce nitrogen so you don't have to feed the alfalfa nitrogen. But corn doesn't produce nitrogen so you have to deliver nitrogen to the corn, but you can't, if you put it in when you plant the seed, the, the nitrogen goes into the air very quickly and, and it just disappears. So uh, I came up, I, I saw an article in the Dairy Farmer magazine and, I, and, and it was a guy that basically took the, the corn plant and stripped all the, the equipment off of it, ran through the corn when the corn was four and a half feet tall, knocked the corn down and then put the, the nitrogen at that time in. Well, let me tell you, the entire county came out and watched the crazy surgeon knocking down his beautiful corn, 200 acres of corn, like this picture shows over here. And of course, three days later, as the dairy farmer from Iowa told me, the corn would pop right back up. And that year, I had the record of corn crop for the state in the history of the state. So it was taking risks. And boy, let me tell you, for three days, I was scared. So happiness lies not in the mere possession of money, it lies in the joy of achievement, in the thrill of the creative efforts at Franklin Roosevelt. I had a dream, I moved to Hawaii and I read everything I could about energy and I had a dream. And, and I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I figured out a way to extract oil out of oil shale. I remember going to my desk, drawing pictures on a, on a piece of paper, uh, writing it all out, went to sleep at six o'clock in the morning. I didn't remember anything excepting that I got up in the middle of the night. I went to my desk, I saw it. Within one week, I submitted a patent. Uh, essentially, what it came out to be, there was when I was in a dairy farming business, the you, uh, cheese uh, makes whey as a byproduct. And, excuse me, and, and whey is this creamy stuff that you see here. And if you can get the water out of whey, it becomes good chicken feed but you can't boil the water because it denatures the protein. So somebody came up with the idea you can, can boil it in a, in, a, in, a, in a chamber and reduce the atmospheric pressure, and by doing that you got way out, and bingo, you got, you got a good chicken feed without denaturing the protein, and I applied the same thing to the oil business and submitted a uh, patent for that as well. I always submit patents. I have about four dozen patents. And, and I got the patent rejected because three weeks before I did it, Standard Oil submitted the exact same patent. I was very proud of myself, the fact that I had done the same thing that they did, and, and the rejection of the patent was an issue. So a patent is an invention, uh, is an assemblage of technologies or ideas that you can put together that way that nobody has put that way together before. I developed wind farms, made a another fortune, 
uh, in that, uh, built about a quarter of a billion dollar business outside of Palm Springs, sold that business. Uh, then with that, I went into, uh, so Walt Disney said around here, we don't look backwards for very long. Uh, we look forward, opening up new doors, doing new things because we're intellectually curious and we like change, challenge. And I think that defines me to some degree. I worked in artificial intelligence. I got a job uh, working at, uh, with one of the great founders of AI. I got educated in computers and I figured I was a hot shot so I formed my own computer company. And then all the money I made on the windmill business I lost. <laughs> I started my own software company. I went from a fortune to be broke and uh, practically in the, in the street again. Uh, so uh, having lost all my money, as he says, bad timing, I did come up with something that was very clever from the, my computer efforts and I realized a way uh, to manage data. So I came up with uh, a, a, another patent called uh, the use of bipartite graph theory for database uh, representations. And in this picture you see, this is the way data was, was listed, was created in lists. A is related to D, E, and F. And I came up with the idea that you could sit, put A, D, E, and F in graphs. And this was a patent. I made millions of dollars off of this, by the way. And, and many of the big companies paid me royalties on this. So uh, this is an example of how you follow data through visually. You don't need algorithms. You can use all visual representations and you could drill down, dr drill down on any data that you want. I built a company called HeartCheck America. I had eight clinics around the United States. I did CT scans with the heart. The Mayo Clinic endorsed what we were doing, uh, but the cardiology community objected to it because it took away their bread and butter, their, their stress cardiogram. We did about 150,000 people uh, in that period of time. I made a lot of money again, so I started to rebuild my fortune that I had lost the last time. Creativity is inventing, experimenting, growing, taking risks, breaking rules, making mistakes, and having fun. So I look at life as having fun. Then I uh, saw the world of hair transplants. I won't go into that. A rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a single man, a man contemplates it, bearing within him the image of a cathedral. So there is the rock pile to the left. Uh, we all saw the plugs of the old days. And as the Godfather says, I wouldn't have had a transplant done on me in those days. And um, so I, I decided to change the rock pile. And these are my patients from the early and mid 90s. Uh, that I had done, and I think I started uh, to, to establish a, a different technology of small graphs and large sessions, along with other doctors from around the world. An invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come, said Victor Hugo. So there were a lot of problems with hair transplants. Uh, uh, I heavily published everything I did in medical journals. Everybody here knows that. I allowed the consumer to drive the business. Uh, and uh, everybody uh, kind of knows most of what I have done. You can prove things through time stamping, who did what first. Everything at be else is at best reinvention and in the worst case, plagiarism. So when everybody claims they invented the FUE, I don't claim anything, okay? I've copied everything. I applied things from other people. I'm the world's worst plagiarist and I admit that to this audience here today. Um, there's always a better way, so in 2002, uh, I published what I had been doing for six years before, which is in my, in my practice, doing FUE. Uh, and uh, in 1998, with Dr. Pack, I built, built a hair transplant robot. We patented the robot. I made another little bundle of money selling the license to Restoration Robotics. And uh, uh, so uh, the robot is another one of my inventions. Uh, my greatest pride uh, today is a business called Maven Biotechnologies. Uh, I saw a patent pending by a brilliant physicist in 2002. I acquired it. I saw in the patent a lab on a chip. The world is but a canvas to the imagination, so I had applied my imagination. Nobody saw what I had seen in that, in that technology. And what it was was a chip, basically a microarray, uh, illuminated by polarized light from below, 
Uh, and by putting a microarray on that surface and taking pictures with a camera, you can put a drop of blood on the surface, and here's the antigens over here, and the antibodies in the blood uh, will pass over the surface, and voila, you've got uh, an antigen-antibody reaction. We were able to read the mass of the molecules with the technology. Uh, I tested this on DNA, sugar, proteins, live cells. I got 23 patents in that field. Uh, essentially, it was reduced to the size of a credit card. The entire hospital laboratory can now be replaced by a credit card with a microfluidic circuit. You take a drop of blood. Uh, actually, a drop of blood has 50 times more fluid than you need to do the test. You run it on the surface. It runs through the mi microfluidic circuit. It runs through all the chemistries. It's put on the glass surface and read by our technology. The, the result is that you can read uh, a drop of blood in 2 to 15 minutes at a cost of a Nikola test. Nobody can beat us. And by the way, with a technology like this, there's no human interference. So you can't make human errors. Once you get the blood on that chip, everything else is, is sails through. So it wipes out a lot of the problems that the, the commercial laboratory ha has. And my goal was to try to address the whole issue of timely delivery of laboratory tests to doctors and try to reduce the time it took so diseases didn't progress while we waited around for the laboratory to go. Uh, in 2012, a friend of mine and I sat down together, and we had another idea. And the godfather says, you don't need more ventures, you need a psychiatrist. And I thought maybe I didn't need a psychiatrist, I'd made some more money uh, trying to recover from all the money I've pumped into my biotech company. At first, if an idea is not absurd, then there's no hope for it, says Albert Einstein. So what we did is we built an app company, and we put apps on, on, on cell phones all over the world. Little under two million cell phones carry an app. And the app reports to us, as soon as a person moves, every five sec, four to five seconds, it reports cell tower signals in the area they are. So as a result of that, we are the best company in the world to determine the strength of cell towers in every building, east, west, north, south, the floor of the building, the GPS location, in every city in the world. And uh, we basically sell this data to people. So here's how it works. Here's, here's a suburb of Paris. And this is not city lights. This is a boulevard with cell phones transmitting to mama. And we're collecting these every four seconds. And you can see that here uh, are buildings that have very poor signal strength. These are skyscrapers. Here's a shopping center that's got some areas of no signal strength at all, so people lose their cell towers. And it tells the cell tower companies where to put to cell towers so they can make money. We sell this data to cell tower companies and telecoms, and it's turning out to be a nice business, and it's just starting to take off. It just turned a profit, by the way. Okay, so uh, I have other business ventures and other ideas. I'm afraid to go forward, so if there's anybody in this audience that has some extra money and has some extra time, and doesn't know what to do, they can meet with me at the meeting. I have some non-disclosure agreements with me, and you can sign that, and I could talk to you later about some of my new ideas and some of the businesses that you can get involved with me on. So let's go back to the, the theme of this discussion to tell you that about the entrepreneurs in the hair transplant business. There are a bunch of them. Okay, uh, in case you didn't know it, the first hair transplant was done in 1822 in Germany. And it was done by a man that was trying to put feathers in animals and get them to grow, and then he eventually transplanted his hair to his arm. So that was the first transplant, so Dr. Cotto doesn't, doesn't get all the credit, it goes way back. And if you take a look at the people on this list, many of them are in this audience, they're all heroes of mine. They're, they're the entrepreneurial, hero, entrepreneurial heroes of this industry. And there's just some of them. Many of them are not who are here, and many of them are not listed on this list, and I think you can, re you can recognize recognize who they are. So what the hair, hair transplant entrepreneur should know. He should know that, you, that all the people, even the old timers, went through this hell of an experience. Do you know that the surgical market will change in the next decade? Uh, that the new treatments and more comp competitors will arrive for this business and the treatment of hair loss over the next five to ten years? And it will radically change this industry. You can, you can carve out your position in the new hair transplant market. You must learn to adapt, to change, or go out of business. And in conclusion, I have two messages for you. First, from the godfather, 
If you weren't inspired by this talk, you can sleep with the fish. Good old line. <laughs> and my thoughts were, youth comes twice, once as it is lived and again as it is remembered. Although it doesn't seem like it at the time, youth as lived is very brief, while youth as remembered can stretch into decades and glancing back at a personal museum invisible to others while it provides a secret foundation to the person's life. I thank you all for being patient with me. Thank you.